All right. Well, fantastic. As I always say, uh, today on That's Classic, we have an individual that uh, I have to say, I mean, talk about like television history. I mean, this guy's amazing. First of all, he's the son of Sherwood Schwartz, who created Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch. He also uh, was involved with both of those shows as uh, dialogue coach, writer, producer. Uh, he's done various Brady Bunch projects uh, in addition to that. Uh, tons of plays. Anyway, I want to welcome Lloyd Schwartz. Lloyd, welcome to the show. Don, it's a pleasure to be here. I, and, and I'm one of my favorite subjects, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. Um, and also today, I have to say, coming back, thank you, my co-host, my <laughs> dear friend, Bob Bergen. Bob, thanks for uh, doing this with me. I only do this for the salary and the residuals, John. You know that. <laughs> well, at least you're honest, and I appreciate that. Also, I, I got to tell you, Lloyd and Bob happen to also be very close friends themselves. So that's another, yeah. you know, little benefit of of the whole thing. It's kind of nice. So um, anyway, Lloyd, right out of the gates, uh, I I saw a ton of stuff on you. But one that I caught my eye is that you actually appeared in an episode called The Cincinnati Kids. How did that come about? Well, uh, we were, it's one of the few episodes we did uh, that wasn't just on on the stage. And so we're going to do it in Cincinnati. And there's a little part in there. And um, I, I didn't want to, I was associate producer and I didn't want to spend the money to send another actor back there and to give them housing and all that. And so I, I looked at the crew and at that time I was in my early twenties or something. So I looked around and I saw there was nobody in the crew who was that age. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. And then um, I learned that acting isn't as easy as I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was it was it fun though to be in front of the camera for that one you know, night? Because you knew obviously you, you know we haven't gotten into it, but you knew the kids really well. Yes, yes. No, it was fun. It was fun, and it was uh, one shot. It was in the rain, and uh, it wasn't supposed to be raining. And they had one shot, and they said, "Quick, let's get it." And there was no coverage, and so. Then when I went back and I edited it, because I have to do that as a you know as an associate producer, I saw a guy who did everything right, but seemed to miss the whole idea of acting. <laughs> so nobody, I don't think other people saw that, but I said, so if you watch the episode and you study it, then maybe you'll see that. But it's it was fun. And I think every every writer, director, producer should do some acting because mm -hmm. it's 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 um eye-opening. And Lloyd, do we ever discuss that I was living in Cincinnati and happened to be at Kings Island one of the days you guys were shooting? Oh, wow. No, I don't think we did. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so a lot of the park was closed that day. and We didn't know why. And all it said was filming or filming in production or something. They wouldn't let anybody know what it was because, of course, you know, people would go cuckoo. So yeah. all, all I remember was um, they had like a super slide that was closed. And that was my favorite thing at Kings Island. So, yeah. My in, in 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 retrospect, I apologize. Oh, it's all good. I, I got over it. Okay. <laughs> that is so cool, though. Isn't that wild? Like, that's one of those, like, six degrees of separation moments. I mean, that's yeah. crazy. I love yeah. that. So, um, what, you know, first of all, why don't you, just so that, you know, my audience or whatever knows, how did you, you know, obviously, yes, you were the son of Sherwood Schwartz, but how did you actually get involved uh, to begin with? Because didn't you start with Gilligan's Island? initially yeah yeah i um right I, I was in college at the time and then so dad for a summer job i worked a little bit on gilligan's island and then there was a show after that called it's about time Imogene and I, so I was yeah so i was i was a dialogue coach on that i was actually Imogene coca chauffeur too for a while which <laughs> oh was my fun. gosh yeah and so i did that and then i went back to college and i i was uh did some stand-up comedy my partner was a Black Panther and we did a comedy team thing and we were thrown out of many clubs. And then um, and then Dad started to do the Brady Bunch. And he asked if I'd be the dialogue coach on that. And I said, uh, no, no, I have my own career and I already written Love American Style. And, all. and he said, well, who, who should be the dialogue coach on this show? And I said, I said, well, somebody who is young. And he said, well, you're young. And he said, and somebody who's been a dialogue coach before, I said, and he said, well, you've been a dialogue coach before. He said, somebody who's done some performing, performing and somebody worked with kids and I ran a summer camp. And I eventually was just describing me and I think he was luring me in to this. And so I did dialogue coach and I did that for uh, one year or a year and a half or something. And I wanted to move on from that. 
And he said, uh, well, we need you to do this. And I said, well, I should be, a, I could be a social producer. <laughs> and so they made me a social producer. I was the youngest social producer. And then, but he, he did give me the title. He gave me a, a title of a production associate, which was the same as an associate producer, but without the title and the salary. And so about, <laughs> yeah, it's about seven or eight episodes in, I said, you know, you didn't hire an associate producer. And I said, I want the title and I want the salary. And so, okay. So that I did that for a while. And then I know Paramount started sending me out as a, as a dialogue coach on other shows with kids. Wow. Well, I didn't see my career doing that. I mean, I did that, but, and so I, I said, uh, I don't want to just be an associate producer. And I said, what can you do? I said, I can direct. And so I directed episodes. And then, then they said, well, they were very happy with the directing. And they said, we want you to direct a lot of episodes next year. And I said, well, I don't want to be a television director. Wow. What do you want to be? I said, well, I want to be a producer. So then they made me a producer. <laughs> and so, uh, it went like that. And by the end of the series, I was, you know, a producer. And then I did on Brady Bunch, I did a lot of other shows, a lot of other series and things. Mm -hmm. But on Brady Bunch, every time I come back, I would either write it or executive produce it. Mm -hmm. And it keeps coming back, you know. Which, which which episode did you direct? It was called Room at the Top. It was when Greg and Marsha were fighting over the attic room. And it was probably most significant because I did one scene where it was like the first scene I was ever directing. And I recognized and they were in the girls' room and Greg was sitting next, Barry was sitting next to Maureen on the bed. And I noticed that there was another attitude that was not brother and sister. Oh, boy. And it was, Ooh. it was, and I didn't quite know how to tell them this, but uh, there was like steam coming from them. And this is not appropriate for a brother and a sister. And uh, everybody expected us to move on because the lines were all right. And I and I and so finally I had to change the blocking. So there was like he put his arm between them or something. But uh, it was it was pretty interesting. <laughs> wow, that is interesting. Did you yeah. actually ever like in that moment talk to one of them and just say, hey, uh... no, no, I didn't know they were teenagers. I didn't know how to do that. I just decided to find a different solution. I they made a mistake, were, however. They were really brother and sister. They were brother and sister by marriage. Today, do you think that today's, if it's on Hulu or streamed, would they have gone with that possibly? Uh, we kidded about that in uh, some of the sat satirical movies. Mm -hmm. You know, there was, a, there, was, there was some of that. I made a mistake, however, uh, in Hawaii. Hawaii episodes. Because oh, I, in, I was interested in this woman there. Who uh, and I said, oh, let's go on a, a, a walk in the evening in the sunlight, the moonlight, or whatever. And so I invited the kids too, and they they kind of paired up, <laughs> which um, which probably wasn't smart on my part <laughs> because most of my life, most of my career, on then in terms of the dialogue and stuff, like coach, I I spent time trying to throw water on them to keep them apart, you know. <laughs> but wow, wow. Yeah. Hey, I want to go back. I, uh, you know, yeah. you can't mention. Hey, oh, I was also the chauffeur for Imogene Coca and you know, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. What was she actually really like, and how did that come about? <laughs> Imogene Coca was wonderful. We became very close friends. She is the shyest woman in the world. What? Totally, totally shy. You couldn't get a word out of her until she came onto the stage, and then she was a lion. And that's the way she always was. She was even that way, and I don't know if you where you how you where your viewers are, how far back they go. They go but back in show of shows with Sid Caesar, she never met, she never knew Sid Caesar. She never knew Sid Caesar. They really? would come on and be terrific together. And when I was with Imogene, you know, if we're out to dinner or something, people would always come up and they go, How's Sid? She never knew. She just said, Fine. Oh. Isn't that fascinating? Some people just come alive like that. And then then in the corner, she'd be like quiet and like this. Yeah, but Lloyd, haven't people... you found that so many, especially comics, yeah. are, are shy people, but give them, give them work, give them an audience, give yeah. them material, and that's where they shine. Uh, yeah, then there's the other ones who are never off, but then there's oh, the that's, that's, that, 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 <laughs> but we don't have dinner with them. <laughs> I was gonna say that's yeah. fascinating though because you know you think of like George Burns and Gracie Allen 
you know, you you almost see like Sid Caesar and Imogene Coca in right. that same vein. Right. That is that wow, that's really something. I I mean, I've read a ton on Hollywood. I never knew that. That's that's really interesting. Yeah. Wow. Well, look, look, even on on the Brady Bunch, you know, Florence really didn't know Bob Reed very well. I mean, they came together and were husband and wife on there. But uh, it was just a job in a lot of ways. You know. And you brought That's Imogene it. back for an episode of the Brady Bunch. Yes, we did. And, Which was and, a great and episode. I had, yeah, we did. We did that. And um, I had two of my favorite women were in that, which was Ambie Davis, who I was very close with, and Imogene Coca. And so, but their styles were so different. Uh, Amby Davis was extremely rehearsed at every beat, you know, like Lucy, by the way, people don't know that, but Lucy was very rehearsed every beat. And then uh, uh, Am Imogene Coca was like all over the place. She was like Robin Williams. I mean, you just, you know, all, you never knew what you were going to get. That's just their styles and they're both fabulous and great people, but it's interesting putting them together like that. Did Imogene ad lib? Um, no, she didn't even ad lib, but she just took things in different places that you didn't expect it to go. Interesting. You, you said you were close with Ambie Davis, obviously. Very close. Alice, their their housekeeper, their their uh, I would say their angel, however you want to put it. What um uh how when you say you were close, like like throughout uh, even after the show? Yeah, yeah. We were very close. Actually, when I was she taught me how to drive stick. I remember this. We we uh so I got this uh Porsche 914, not a big expensive Porsche, but a little Porsche. And so I do not drive six. So we're up at Dodger Stadium. She's teaching me how to drive in the parking lot there. And then the police came and or guards. And then they were starting to come, you know, uh, stop me from doing it. And then they realized it was Ann B. Davis, Alice, and they just let us go. So that was cool. But um after after the show, you know, she moved out of town. Her birthday is May 3rd. My birthday is May 2nd. And so she would always call on my birthday. And then the next day was her birthday. So I we had nothing more to say. So I recognized this. So I started calling her on May 1st. Oh my God. And then she saw the my my devious ways. And so she started calling on April 30th. <laughs> it's like that. Oh my God. But I actually I actually had the honor and the sadness of uh doing her eulogy. She's she's in uh, San Antonio. She died a few years ago. Oh, wow. Wow. You yeah. guys were really close. We were very close. She came to like, she stayed out here and then in my house, you know, she'd come over and we had my kids bar mitzvah or something as soon as she was there. But I told her she didn't have to clean the house. You know, she just go. <laughs> so, yeah. well, let me ask you, as far as, uh, you know, the Brady Bunch kids, what, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm thinking back, you were in there really early then. If you were like, like the dialogue yeah. coach, what were they like when the cameras weren't rolling? I mean, what 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 were they into? What was going on on uh, behind the scenes there? You know, many shows when they are created, it has a description of the kids. Like one kid is uh, eats all the time, and one kid's real mm -hmm. smart and all. You know, Dad said, "I want real kids," and so they were very much like who they were, except with different names. Hmm. So. Uh, and and it was it was good that way. And so and as we started to work with them, we realized more and more who they were. So we started focusing uh, episodes toward who their real personalities were. Did they play together offset? Oh, yeah. All like the time. All the time. They stayed over each other's houses. You know, most shows, if you have like a kid or maybe two, um, it's they're in an adult world. But these kids shared the same experience. And in fact, Mike Lookinland, who played Bobby, he was offered uh, the the part of uh, Eddie and Portia of Eddie's father. Oh yeah. At the same time, and his parents thought it would be smarter if she went and he went out of the Brady Bunch, where there'd be a lot of kids. And so they were they were all very close. They're still very close today. That's well, there's funny. a uh, Barry and, and Chris have a really good podcast called The Brady right. Bros, which right. is, is is it's actually for 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 Cato's fans check it out it's so good they'll do it's basically a rewatch <clears throat> podcast where they talk about past episodes both of them admit actually I take that back chris admits he's never seen these for years yeah. i think barry <laughs> watches them anyway and then they have, they'll, do a, they'll do a q a but one of the things they brought up recently which i want to hear your your pov on this uh lloyd okay. is that the first season it's their point of view that the show revolved around the parents 
Yeah. And then from season two and forward, it revolved around the kids. Is that how you and your dad saw it too? Yes, that was absolutely true. Um, and it was my, and I'll, I'll take credit for this. And it was my idea to change the song in the second second year to the kids singing. And that's how we became the Brady Bunch because it was about, was about the kids. And my, and then we, we realized, and dad realized that it's very hard for kids to get involved in changing lives of parents, but it's parents involved in life, changing lives of kids. And so we focused on the kids after that. There's only maybe one or two episodes after that, where it was about the parents. Wow. That's so cool, by the way, about what you just said about changing the, the uh, music with the kids. I can it was very fun. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story about that. So, okay, we're gonna I want the kids just to sing it as kids. So I go to you know the to record this, and the kids are there. And so the Paramount Music said, uh, who's uh, the musical director for this? And I said, uh, me. <laughs> and they said, uh, okay, um, what about the harmonies? I said, there won't be any harmonies. They're kids just singing like kids. And I said, okay, and so they did that. And that's how it sounds. They just kids singing. And then when we did the feature films, which I've produced also the feature films, they wanted to pay the kids royalties or, you know, because we're going to reuse the soundtrack. They wanted them. And I go, why are we doing that? Just have these the, kids They wanted singing. the original kids? Not the kids yeah, the they wanted cast? to pay the original kids for the, what they recorded it way back. And I said, kids sound like kids. Just have this group do it. What are you worried about? And that's what they did. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is pretty wild. Did um by the way going back uh with your dad I mean yeah. I think people just assume like look you were his son that no wonder he got in the business or whatever but two things Wh why what was it like to work for your father was it a situation where it was just like oh I'm his son he's just sweetheart to me or was he tough and also what really got you to say hey I want to be in the business okay those are a lot of questions hey I um... ask a lot what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working? My dad was the best producer I ever worked with. I worked with a lot of other producers after that. And there was nobody even close. And by the way, I didn't think I was going to learn that. But I learned that because he cared about the shows. He cared about the people, you know. So that was great. And and now he worked with me. He left the set basically to me. He was upstairs working on the scripts and things. And he trusted me. I remember there was one day we were filming in the backyard. And it was a master shot and he came in and watched it. And he said, that was really good. That was really good. Cause he was always a cheerleader kind of a guy. And I said, uh, yeah, but it wasn't as good as you want it to be. And then I went over and gave some direction and they get it and they, they did it. And dad said, okay. And he left because, <laughs> and he just trusted me. And I'd have to do all the little rewrites and things on the stage. And then, you know, it was, I enjoyed the challenge. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the challenge of, especially Robert Reed, who was not easy to work with. I was going to ask. Um, if he would come up with an issue while the lights were on and we're ready to film and understand that's a very expensive time on the stage with the lights and everything like that. Every minute, thousands of dollars. And he would come up with something. He would come up with a problem. And I had to solve it instantly. And I, I enjoyed that kind of pressure. So but did, like, he, did he respect your youth when you would do that? Uh, no, he didn't. It yeah. wasn't the youth. It just he expected me, respected me as a as a talent. Okay. Uh, not not the youth, but we did in terms of breaking stories, because I was involved in that. I would represent the young person's point of view, you know. And so we got into those, and a lot of the episodes uh, were, especially the dating episodes, were sad reflections of my life. <laughs> such <laughs> as, such as, something suddenly came up. When I would a girl, I'd ask a girl up, and she could, she somehow something suddenly came up, and so I said we put that in because I heard that excuse too many times. <laughs> those were great moments. I love those moments in the show. Yeah, yeah. What um, also cheerleading? Cheerleading. I was a cheerleader, so anytime there were pom pom girls and things, and they, that would go in there. Oh, that's pretty cool. Did yeah. um, by the way, you mentioned Robert Reed, and it, it's pretty well known out there that you know yeah. he was, I, I mean, it, he could cause a lot of issues on the show. I mean, I had heard that there was a lot of bumping heads. Yeah. Where do you think that was actually coming from uh, in his case? 
Well, it wasn't until later upon reflection that I kind of figured all the psychological, the depth of all of his problems. You know, he 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 had his own child and kind of abandoned that whole life. And he's, he was gay. He was closet gay. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to be a leading man. And suddenly he was saddled with these six kids and he loved the six kids and he wanted to be like their real father. He saw them as healthy. He was. He was like he saw them as, as saw himself as their real father, and so they they wasn't. And if anybody was, it was my dad and me by fallout. And so we would fight about that kind of stuff. Oh wow! Yeah, it was it was pretty deep in terms of. But I I didn't um, I didn't understand all that. I was pretty young. Yeah. I mean, but you imagine I'm I'm 22, 23 years old. I'm on the set, and he would turn to the camera after this one take. I remember. And he would say, while well, the camera's rolling, and he would say, Sherwood Schwartz, I hope you fry in hell for this. Okay, because you, can you imagine? I'm 22, 23 years old. And all the lights are on. The crew is there. And he's saying this kind of stuff. And um, I didn't know how to deal with that. You know, I mean, emotionally, I didn't know how to deal with it. Well, first of all, oh. for, let, let's just start with how unprofessional that was. Forget oh. that you're, you're, the, you're the producer and the showrunner's son. The fact that you mm. put those two together I mean, that's that that that's that's abuse. That borders on cruel. That doesn't border on cruelty. That's cruelty. Yeah, that's ridiculous. it was. And I and again, and everybody's looking at me to see how I'm going to react to this. And so I just walked off and I remember going into the alley there behind the stage and started crying because I didn't know mm -hmm. how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So and um, it was it was it was constant battles like that. I remember years, years later, when we came back for the reunion shows, I remember Florence came. And we were very close to Florence. And so she said, Robert said that he felt bad after all these years that somehow he was unkind and all that. And some, he started off a little kind, then got a little mean, got a little testy. And I said to Florence, you know, he just skipped all that, went right to asshole, I told her. And so <laughs> she said she went back and told Robert that. And Robert said, he, she said he laughed for 20 minutes. <laughs> well, but, but why do you think he kept oh. coming back? I mean, the first thing he came back to, you guys didn't do, which was the variety show. But then when you did the Brady Brides or the movie that became the series. Right, right. Uh, what, what, why do you think, what, why did he come back? Because, uh, and there's some other stuff, he actually wasn't going to be in the sixth year if there was a sixth year. But there, since there wasn't, and we did the reunions, he came back because he saw himself as the father of the kids and mm. nobody was going to be there to get them married off except him. He bought himself out of a play to go do that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. What, Hey, were you involved by the way with the, any of the casting, the initial casting no. uh, or were you present for any of that? No, I was, I was in college. I got uh, the, you. I, the, yeah. The, 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 I wasn't, I knew about it. I knew how he did it and all that, but I wasn't there. Uh, I was at the I was at the the, um, the screen test of a few other fathers for the for the I mean husbands, and he was the one I didn't want. <laughs> but I mean, who did was, you want? Who did you want? Uh, Jeffrey Hunter. Jeffrey Hunter came in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, and, Lloyd, uh, was 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 this the day of the contract players? Because Jeffrey Hunter was the original captain on the first Star Trek pilot. Uh, I don't know about yeah. that part of it. I know that Robert Reed was under contract. He was okay. under contract to, to Paramount. And so, and this was a Paramount show. Right. So, I mean, I'm, I can't say they were pushing him, but, um, you know, he was good with Florence. He was good. He, he, you know, he was a strong father figure. Mm -hmm. And that's what dad wanted. He wanted us. He didn't want, because there were so many buffoon fathers, you know, Jackie Gleason or Life O'Reilly or, you know, all those kind of idiot fathers. And so he said, no, a strong father figure. And Robert did that. He did it with an absence of comedy, which is another reason we went to the shows about the kids. <laughs> he lectured real well. And I had a great time when we did the movies. I mean, the feature, the satires, to be able to poke fun at his lectures. Because in real life, when we, I mean, not real life, when we were doing the Brady Bunch, he would do these lectures. I would just would laugh. I mean, I have to get off because it, it was so, you know. Was that, that, was, that was Gary Cole, right? Yeah. His bo his voice was so both of them they nailed those voices and I'm I a agree. voice guy so I know I, voices they nailed they were voices. great they were great they were great it's not the casting I wanted I mean I wanted Madonna as Mrs Brady but uh, I ran into studio problems with that what? that's different wow. yeah I just I just wanted um to be I didn't want them to be you know, impressions I wanted them to be just 
funny. I wanted like Kevin Nealon and Madonna. I thought, but uh, wow. and first of all, I like Gary. I love working with him. He's a great guy, and I like working with Shelley. So it was fine. Gotcha. Did uh, switching, you know, whatever. We'll flip back and forth. But you, you said early on that you worked on Gilligan's Island. What, uh, what was that cast like? Uh, you know, obviously Bob Denver, Alan Hale Jr., yeah. Jim Backus. I worked. I worked on the original for just a couple of days. I did produce the reunion movies, so I got to know them very well. Oh, rescue um, from Gilligan's Island. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually in that too with Barbara. Well, Bob, my, okay. Um, where, 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 where are you in that? Where yeah. are you guys? Okay. Well, the castaways are on the island. Uh, there was a guy pining for Marianne, who was kind of been, well, for 15 years. And so when they came back to society, they were going to, they decided they had to get married because of this. But in the meantime, I had fallen in love with their best friend. And so we were going to go through the wedding, me and Marianne anyway. And then the skipper and Gilligan find this out, this other aspect. And they pull me away. They pull Marianne away. And then I'm stuck and I marry her best friend, played by my wife, Barbara. That's so awesome. Cool. I did, by the way, I did all of this with no lines. <laughs> and so... Barbara had all the lines. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, quick, quick question about the reunion movie because it was great. Yes, I mean everybody anticipated. It was the time when they were doing "I Dream of Jeannie" fifteen years later. Yep, that's and, right. And 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 the Gilligan one, it just looked and felt like an, an the next episode of Gilligan. They, right. they did a great job reproducing the sets. Um, right. But here's my here's my question: Was it a conscious choice to not have a laugh track? Uh, I don't even remember, but I'm sure if it was a movie, and there's very few movies with laugh tracks. So, but I it think was that... a very long episode of Gilligan's Island. And from, <laughs> from the audience standpoint, I was like, yeah. "What's missing here?" It was, and by the way, it felt like that the that the characters, the actors, held for the laugh. They probably did, yeah. They probably did. They were great people. The here when we talk about whether people are like what they're like, Bob Denver was. And we were we were very good friends. He would when he would come out to, he's kind of a hermit. He would always like live on the on a mountaintop somewhere or something. And when he came in, he didn't he didn't even have like possessions and things. So he'd come in, so he'd stay at my house. And one time he stayed at my house and then we did another movie and he came back. He said, you know, last time I was out to dinner was at your house. It was like two years in between. Wow. But very, very bright act, very good actor, one of the great reactors of all time. I had a chance to run lines with him all the time and he would even act like I was acting. And wow. then um Mary, I mean, uh, Marianna was close with. Uh, I never know. I didn't know Tina. She didn't do the movies. She didn't reach out. Why did she, by the way? I was going to ask you that. Well, uh, some of it was money. Some of it she felt that that it hurt her whole career. She wanted to get away from it. Hmm. You know, there's people like that. I don't I don't blame them. I mean, I, don't, I haven't had to live that life. You know, I'm identified right. totally. like. But yeah. Um, and then Jim is very much like he is, and and uh, Jim Backus. I used to have a good time. I would always go up to him and do my, because he was the dad in Rebel Without a Cause. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I would come up and do my best James Dean impression. You know, I'd go, you're tearing me apart. And you say, would you just cut that out? But um, <laughs> and it was it was sad because the last thing he ever did was uh, Heart of Gold Trotters on Gilligan's Island. And he wasn't in it because he was very ill. And then one day he called up and he said, can you put me in for a scene? Mm. And uh, dad did. And then we had a scene where he came in, you know, for the big celebration or something. And I know I watched them walk off together, dad and Jim, because they, they'd worked together starting in the radio. And then my, my Mary Joan. And so they walked off together and everybody was sobbing on the set because they knew this was the last time mm. he would probably ever do it. Wow. Anything. Wow, what a moment. What, yeah. what you just mentioned, I Married Joan, was that a radio show before it was a TV show? Um, and I don't think so. Because your dad did do a lot of radio, didn't he? Yes, he did a lot of radio. And then what happened, you know, the difference when radio became television, all the people who had done radio moved over and did television. And so dad on radio, he did uh, Alan Young, he did Beulah, he did uh, Ozzie and Harriet, Danny Thomas, a lot of those. And then World War II, he did those uh shows for the the soldiers so the first television he did was i Mary joan and jim backus was in that and that's where they they actually worked together on the radio too and he came back for a gilligan guest star so did natalie schaefer yeah oh yeah. good one 
And was yeah. this was this all intentional? Hey, let's bring back some familiar faces. <laughs> Not. I don't know. Intentional. Dad is just very loyal to people. Mm -hmm. He likes working with people he knows and things. What What about Alan Hale Jr. By the way, what was he like? Because obviously well, he comes from like Hollywood royalty kind, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, which which was interesting because his dad and people today don't know his dad as well as they know Alan. Right, uh, Alan Jr. And, and and he always would live and identify with this a little bit. He identified. He lived in his father's shadow. He looked like him. He looked exactly like him. Yeah. And he was always Alan Hill Jr. And then when he had a chance to do The Skipper, he got an identity that he never gave up after that. He would wear that hat and he was always the skipper and he loved it. He loved being the skipper. Wow. He was the antithesis of, of Tina Louise. Yes. Yeah. He had yeah. a restaurant here and he would actually be the maitre d' with the hat. That's right. And greet people. Happily greet. Carol O'Connor had a restaurant in Beverly Hills and did the same thing. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, oh, but exactly. Alan, you know, we took his hat, and I think it's in the Smithsonian or someplace. No, some museum somewhere, because Dad bronzed it. <laughs> the hat. <laughs> Is it in that comedy museum out in New York that they have now, in like Jamestown? Maybe, maybe. Wow. Different. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, really interesting. Um. So, Lloyd, just just to, in general, when you think of the Brady Bunch, what was like just a typical day on the set like? Like, what was it? You know chaotic was it what was the what was the general well vibe? one one thing that you think about when you think of the, about the brady's is six kids running around right we didn't have more than one scene like that in an episode each of the episodes were broken down into kids one scene with the kids another scene with other kids and the reason for that is they had to go to school hmm. so they were going to school and then i would go get them when their next scene was and so and then they all had this had a wonderful teacher named um, Frances Whitfield. And so she would be with them all the time. And so in their schoolroom. And then that was just off the set. I have to ask a question based on what you just said. Did, so when they did the, the Snow White show on the backyard and they were you doing mean, it yeah. for Mrs. Whitfield, and that was that the was, character's name. And that was the woman, too. Get out of here. That is so yeah. funny. I, yeah. I'm, I'm just wow. now putting that together when you said their school teacher's name. And because I'm a TV geek, that's why I do this with Kato. And I'm like, yeah. wait a minute. That is like, by the way, did you have to tap Hartley her? Uh, she had been an actress once before, before. I think we did. I think we did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bob, good pickup. I love <laughs> that one. And I know <laughs> why I'm talking about. It. <laughs> one of the first people I've ever heard reference that. That's good. That's so funny. <laughs> I love it. Hey, by the way, the other one, um, it, you mentioned the Hawaii episodes, which everybody knows that. They know the Grand Canyon episodes. But am I right on this? Because I'll be honest, I haven't seen the Hawaii ones in a long time. Was Vincent Price in that one? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. What was that like working with him? Okay. So uh, he didn't go to Hawaii. We did those episodes here that he was in on a stage, you know, like yeah. that. I will say this, and I've said it, just not just in it. He was the most professional actor I ever worked with. Wow. And he loved it. I remember I, I would always be the first one on the stage because I always thought producers, somebody from the producer always should be there when the actors show up. And he was already there. Wow. And we talked and he said to me, you, you probably want to know why I'm here so early. And I said, yeah. And he said, because there's nowhere else I'd rather be. Mm, I love and that. He was just... That fabulous he knew everybody's lines his own lines and just just a charming guy he also knew everything about art everything about food yeah and i knew everything about hamburgers and so we we came together on discussing he also knew all about hamburgers so, <laughs> so wow. wow great great guy and if you talk to anybody you work with them they say the same thing oh i love hearing that what by the way you had a lot of guest stars on the show um wh what were some of your favorites that showed up I think when the sports stars, because I was, you know, young and, you know, I remember talking to Joe Namath. He just won the Super Bowl. Oh. And uh, I said, uh, Joe, hey, listen, what about this year? Should I put any money on the Jets? And he said, bet on him. And they went four and 12 or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Lost my shirt. Not really. Oh, I, and I like Drysdale. Drysdale, he was great. So the sports stars I like, you know. Yeah. And then uh, what about uh, 
uh, Davy Jones. That's that's one that I always remember. Well, it was interesting because Davy Jones came in and he had been a you know the Monkees was a fun, you know phenomenal uh, success, and so he came in with a you know very kind of a, a little bit of an attitude. He's going to be on the Brady Bunch, but he was the monkey, you know, and um, nice, nice guy. And then later on, I would just go to some events with him. And he turned out that his kids and everybody knew him from the Brady Bunch more than the monkeys. Oh. And so he always had to do that song when they would go off a concert and stuff. So <laughs> that's awesome that he had to sing the song, too. Yeah. Love it. You know, you were mentioning earlier that some of the, the episodes were based on your own life and things like like that yeah were there any episodes that you remember that were um particularly let's say personal or uh you know seemed like they affected the kids themselves like the kids kind of connected you know uh deeply on their own well uh it was interesting um i'll tell you my favorite episode and why but i've chris had some difficulty because chris uh was by the way, Chris, I was probably my, of all the Bradys, is probably my closest friend now. Wow! Um, but um, he had, they had to, he had to grow up, and so sometimes he had to have to play with women, and he had never had a, a a situation like that before. There was a couple episodes he found like he was there was one where he had to pretend that he was Barry's, you know, uh, good friend, a double date. They put a mustache on him and stuff, and he was just nervous as could be. He'd never been around a girl before like that. Wow. And these were women. You know, <laughs> what do I do? Yeah. So he had that problem. But um, my, the one that affected me the most, and it's been, my favorite episode was um, um, my, my hero, Jesse James. My, yeah, I can't remember the title, My Hero or something. Mm -hmm. I know or Jesse James was about. his hero. And it was, and I'm very anti gun. And so on that episode, there's a dream sequence. And if you watch this episode, you'll see what, what I'm talking about. There's a dream sequence when Jesse James comes into the thing and he's going to rob the Brady's and that's a train and they're all going like this, like it's a train and it's coming comedic and they're in kind of old West outfits and things. And he takes a cardboard gun and just and Mike, Mike Brady, Mike uh, looking at it, Bobby Brady, Jesse, you're my hero, I'm my hero. And he says, yeah. And he shoots the Brady's by just saying bang, bang, bang with this phony gun. Mm hmm. And I went to Francis Whitfield, the welfare worker, and I said, I want to do this a little differently, and I think it's going to be worth it. And I explained to her, and she said, yeah, do it. And I went to the director. I said, no rehearsal on this. Just set the camera back. Because, And I took Mike Lickenland aside, and I talked to him what it's like to see real people really hit by guns, really hit by bullets, talk how awful that is, blood spurting and all that. Because I wanted him to see that. Wow. I didn't want to see the Brady's dying funny. I wanted to see in his head, I wanted him to see how horrible that would be. And so that's what he did. And if you watch that sequence, you'll see the terror in little Bobby's face yeah, when he's saying, that. Jesse, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, and uh, maybe it's maybe it wasn't the, the right thing to do in a comedy show to do that. But I just wanted to make a statement that way. And then afterwards, I took Mike aside. And uh, I had to debrief him and bring him down, and get him away from that stuff. But I think, and then at the end of the show, I remember Mike Bobby Brady goes into his parents and turns in his fake guns. I mean, his toy guns. You yeah, know. I totally remember that. Yeah. I mean, I've done a couple of anti, I mean, I wrote an episode of Alice that was anti-gun and um, they brought me in. Uh, the producers brought me in to read some of the hate mail I got, which were a lot of death threats and things. From the NRA, you know. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Really wild. Um, the uh, wow, that's, that's really interesting. That that's where all of that went. Um, by the way, since you mentioned Alice, and yeah. I think Linda Lavin, and uh, yeah. uh, just what a I've just heard some wonderful things about her, uh, uh, especially when she did the uh, the one with Nicole Kidman, the recent uh, Desi and Lucy. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can't think of the title. But anyway, uh, what was it like working with Linda? I didn't know. I, I was just a writer on the show. Oh, okay. I was a freelance writer. I got so, it. But she was very talented. You know, the show came out really good. Very cool. The other one, uh, going back to the Brady's, A Very Brady Christmas. You have the yeah. whole cast, but no Susan Olsen. What What was yeah. the story there? She was, um, was, it was, it was twofold. Uh, first of all, she was 
on a honeymoon. She was going on honeymoon. She didn't want to postpone that for the show. Mm -hmm. And also by that point, the two other women um, in Florida, I mean, Eve and, and uh, Maureen had done their own series with Brady Girls Get Married. And so they had got a little bit of an elevated position, salary wise and position. And so Susan was not there and with, at that level, at that point. Oh. And so there was a little contract stuff going on. But, um, oh, well, it is what it is. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand. You, uh, by the way, you know, as you said, you you wrote for a couple of different shows. Love American Style, which, by the way, I still love to this day. You know, no pun intended there with the love. But that uh, need, that needs that needs a reboot. That kind of anthology series. Needs a reboot. I wanted yeah, to sell. Great. I wanted to sell Love American Style reality style, and I wanted to have a, a scene from Love American Style that they did, did they do, and then recreate it. What would really happen? Oh wow, that's funny. And you've yeah, got a yeah. plethora of, of uh I know. And I we made you know a presentation. I talked to I knew the producers pretty well. I asked if they would be interested in getting involved. And they said, yeah, and they never really went anywhere. But that's well, you when we did a, when we did that play together two decades yeah. ago, you had chatted with me about the idea of a Gilligan reality show, but your vision wasn't what was done. But I know. You, you, what, what you told me was Let's go around the country and find a billionaire and find a movie star. And that, find... that, that part was done. That part was done, but the show was but it much wasn't different. A reality competition, what, what you what you pitched me. I know. I know. And I fought against that. I put me with a producer that I didn't like. It's one of the few shows I've ever done that I just was involved with and couldn't change. And, you and know. by the way, if I oh. if I remember correctly, your idea for the millionaire was Donald Trump. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, and I think you said in your dream of dreams, Julia Roberts for the movie star. Maybe. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, at the same time, your dad had an idea for a game show. And remember I went over and he was like going over. I, I don't even remember what it was, but I had just come off of hosting Jeff and your I remember sitting in your parents' living room and your dad was playing brady and gilligan trivia with me because i yeah. said to him i said i said test me and he goes <laughs> mrs howell's uh maiden name i said wentworth come on come on <laughs> he, said, he said mrs brady's maiden name i said martin he goes wrong that was her her her, her husband's her uh, name that was her old married name right well that blew me away because <laughs> she, he was he was marrying uh martin's the martin now, girl. Now, you know that on, I think it was the first guy was trying to get in on how to marry. I mean, uh, you want to be a millionaire? That yeah. joke. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, who wants to be a millionaire? The last guy, the guy who got a million, that was like the, the question. One of the questions was Carol Brady's maiden name. And it was four choices. One of them was Martin. One of them was Tyler, which what it was. And then it was Nelson and Franklin. And Nelson and Franklin, if you're a Brady trivia, you should know. Alice Nelson, her name, last name was Nelson, but it was never Nelson until one episode when the mailman came in and said, I got a letter for Alice, but I can't say Alice, does she have a last name? And so <laughs> on the stage, I said, yeah, her last name's Nelson because dad had done Rick, Ozzie and Harriet. And so I oh, said, great, make her Nelson. That's and great then, stuff. I yeah. love that. Yeah. You heard it first. There we go. Uh, same with Frank. Uh, Sam's last name was Franklin. And it was the same thing. We we're on the stage, and you know, on the stage, and he needed a last name. And I mean, he was he was wrapping up some meat in the butcher shop, and I said Franklin because it was a hundred dollar bill there. So, so Alan Melvin was probably one of the busiest character actors in TV for decades. Yeah, yeah. To, what was he like to work with? Great guy. Never really part of the show. He came in just for episodes. So maybe he was in like eight or ten, but it wasn't. And he'd be in for an episode or two or for a few days. So very guys, very talented, very good guy. Not very good with props. <laughs> oh yeah, you had to see him wrap up the meat. He was not so good with that, but um, <laughs> good guy, good guy. He good looked guy. the part, though. He looked. He it. sure did. He sure <laughs> yeah. did. And he looked the part on every show he did. He was. Just yeah, he had that hang dog thing. He was great. Yeah, great exactly. guy. Nice guy. Nice yeah. guy. Totally. Hey, what uh, you you mentioned? Uh, well, actually, you didn't. I, I I'm trying to remember. I saw it. The A team. Um, 
Yeah, Did I wrote that. Do you have any, any uh, connection with that or any any stories around that? I was always a well, fan. Well, uh, my, my son, uh, I think was and my older son, Andrew, um, he liked the A-Team. And so I talked to the producer. I said, can I write one of these episodes? And my idea for it was, I, I just wanted to see, you know, those undersea guys when they're walking around on the bottom with the big thing the helmets yeah, and, big, the, you and know, all that the, stuff yeah that i is. wanted to see mr t in one of those things <laughs> and i wanted to know whether the gold would be outside or inside the the thing by the time they got to it it wasn't a undersea thing it was skin so scuba diving and it was dwight schultz doing it because uh mr t was uh claustrophobic <laughs> but um uh, that was that <laughs> wow interesting yeah. um yeah. So let's, uh, I, I, for everybody out there, Lloyd has a new film uh, that is yes. coming out. and it's Let's talk up. about that. I'm excited but, about that. Yeah. Can we talk about that, Lloyd? Enough. Enough, Brady. Enough. Yeah. Gilligan. yeah. Let's move on. I, um, I always want to move on. It's good. <laughs> like if my dad, I always say to my dad, when people ask him what's his favorite show, and he says the next one, which, <laughs> right. is, which is how I am. And, you know, I've done lots and lots of plays. This 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 show Love and Taxes was based upon a play I did, and it was you know as you, you pick up I had stories everywhere. But it was my relationship with my accountant, and I would go in every year, and he would know everything of me by my checks, and I knew everything about him because of what was on the wall. And it was like, and so he'd see, oh, I went here and I went and I met this girl. So it was a long trip to New York or whatever. Then a long phone call, never no no more New York. So I obviously broke up. He could tell my whole he could tell my whole life that way. And in here, he had a picture of his wife and a kid. And then the next year, the kid was there and the wife was gone. And the next year, the wife was back. He had married her, divorced her, married her again. Oh, geez. And all of that. And I said, this sounds like a good same time next year play if I change my character yeah. into a woman and make it a romantic comedy. And so we did the play, very successful. And I became good friends with Ken Feinberg, who is the director of the movie. And we've done a lot of stuff together. And he always wanted to do it. And under the under the condition that it had to be done a certain way, which I wanted each scene to be one shot. Wow. Oh my God, how that's, how Hitchcock wrote. And that must that's have been right. Back Except back. right. But this was no tricks. It was just one shot with a steady cam. We, we did this movie in three days. Wow. Feature film. Wait, and we're feature gonna, film? We're, this is a feature full film, full length feature film. We're going into the Myrtle Beach Film Festival coming up. We're in the Beverly Hills Film Festival coming up. And it's, you know, a lot of a lot of heat is on the thing. People are talking about, you know, distributors and, and all that kind of thing. And it's done just that way with very talented actors. Very talented actors. Uh, That's incredible. Uh, yeah. Jake Reiner and uh, Alexis uh, uh, Adam. Uh, I can't Abrams. 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 That's right. She, she's, you know, beautiful. We had a lot of cast. 1,200 people sent in you know and we they were not you know we didn't cast it with with stars or anything 1200 people wanted to work and so we narrowed it down for all those people to these really talented people and they had great chemistry and the show is very funny and um uh, that's it well jake reiner that's, is rob reiner's son who i yeah. also read that you and rob went to high school together is no, that true no no college? we went we had college. no college, college. we had, we had in fact, I didn't know him very well, but we would. I remember we took a history of television class. Rob Ryan. Oh, oh my God, that. you guys could have taught that class. <laughs> yeah, well, we could have, and we we just sat there, and the, the woman who was teaching it, uh, she got a lot of stuff wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cato, I got to tell you that you know, just before COVID, my sister and Scott and my and and Lloyd, we took we did a tour of the Brady House. And there yeah. was this oh. really nice guy taking us around and he was telling us all these tidbits and stuff. And Lloyd's like, that's not hundred percent true. <laughs> yeah, you got, you got that off a little bit. <laughs> okay, that one was true. So that must've been the college course with you and Rob Reiner. Yeah, it was a long time. But I can't remember exactly, but I do did remember. Did the instructor, did the, did the professor know that these two legacies of television were in it was a class. long it was a long time ago i can't remember you know oh, i didn't that's... i went i graduated college and you know i would have <laughs> so... i would if my father was with sherwood schwartz and i was with uh norman uh i'm, I'm sorry rob uh uh Carl Reiner. kid i remember <laughs> <laughs> did so yeah. lloyd um 
do you know not not that Jake isn't isn't talented and I have seen a clip and he is by all yeah, means he's very um, talented. but did that tie into it did you know him no. growing up or was this no 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 uh the first time I ever met him was it narrowed down to a couple of people wow uh and then uh, he got it and he didn't get it because he was Rob Reiner's son he got it because he was good mm -hmm. you know and um I still you know by the way I haven't seen Rob Reiner since um, college almost wow Wow, yeah. that is. I probably wild. will see him at one of these screenings. There you go. I will say hi. <laughs> the um, by the way, the other thing that I saw is that you shot it in Atlanta, and right when you said three days, okay, that alone is insanity to be able to do a feature film in three days. I mean, for anybody right. out there that isn't in this business, that just doesn't even comprehend. On top yeah. of it, though, the conditions sounded sweltering to me. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was actually it was during uh, the strike. And we were totally legally allowed to do it because of this micro budget thing. Mm -hmm. So we had to deal with a little bit of that too, plus the heat of it. But, you know, and it was easier for me because I was just there kind of watching and making a couple of suggestions and stuff as a, one, of, one of the producers. Mm -hmm. But these people had to work under those conditions. They had to memorize that whole thing and be able to do each of those scenes in that kind of heat and not only worry about just the acting of it, worrying about where the camera was to avoid that because as they're going through the scene, their 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 camera their camera person was a woman. She was terrific too. She was there avoiding her, and she was avoiding them, and staying in character in the hundred degrees heat. Oh man! And you won't see any of that in the in the movie. You'll just see a. In fact, I was interviewed about it, and they a lot of people talk about the 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 fact that it was done so unusually, and that does does that does that make a statement about the movie? No, the movie has to stand by itself. Mm -hmm. And it's a good movie all by itself. I mean, really talented director, Greg and uh, Ken, the directed together. Uh, really good, really good, really good performances. I'm very proud of this movie. Is there is there a trailer online that people can see? Um, I don't know. Um, if, if, if you go on, probably if you go on Love and Taxes, okay. Love and Taxes, you can probably see something like that. Um, yeah. And I say we're going to be going very soon into these film festivals. Fantastic! And I'm excited. I'm excited about it. It's a good. It's a good little movie. God, congratulations, Lloyd. That's a hell of an accomplishment. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> very cool. Really cool. Yeah. Hey, um, kind of. To, I guess on one of our last questions, Bob brought up the tour of the Brady Bunch house, the one that HGTV renovated, and I right. and you guys did do your private tour. Which, by the way, I do want to say, Lloyd, um, I wish we had known each other then because I would have been on that tour in about seven seconds. But, I would have uh, charged you a lot of money to go on that tour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What uh, What was it like for you, though, really, to be on that tour? Obviously, it wasn't. It was just a set at the time, and now you and Bob are on there. What was it like being there? Well, you know, I was one of the producers of that show. So I was there all the time when they were rebuilding the house to make it look like it. Oh, I didn't I didn't realize you had done that. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was very interesting because people looked at it totally different than I did, because they looked at it as if it was the real house and everything was really accurate. Just a couple of little things were off. I looked at it, remembering how it was to film there, mm -hmm. but we never filmed there. So I looked where I would be standing while the filming was going on, but there was a wall there instead. You know, so it was odd. It was very odd, but um, they did a fabulous job of recreating the whole thing. And it was a hugely successful show. That show was the number one show, I think on television. And it was on HG at the time. Yeah. yeah Cause there's always a love for Brady, you know, Brady oh. bunch is a lot of things, but over isn't one of them. It just keeps going. Right. Right. Yeah. What out of all the the rooms and everything they recreated, all the spots, what did you think was like, wow, that's like crazy that they did that? I I can't. I mean, every single room was fine. I mean, I, I mean, I saw a little I mean, I think I think the bed was a little smaller in order to get into that room or I mean, but it was so minus, you know, I mean, I, I mean, anybody who just goes on it, they think that's it. That's it. So I so I will tell you that one of my favorite parts of that tour, and I sent Cato a bunch of these pictures, yeah. was taking pictures from a perspective that the camera never saw. Uh -huh. Such as, I remember I've got a picture of you standing at the front door and I'm in the closet taking a picture looking out. Yeah, and I've got a picture standing okay. at the sink 
of the kitchen, taking a picture, looking that way. And I did that throughout the house. I mean, I'm sure everybody wants to, oh, look, I got a picture of the living room. No, I, I, I'm from under the staircase looking up. <laughs> or, I mean, that, that I found more interesting or as interesting, I should say, as the, as the actual house. So my question to you about the house is, with all the sequels that they did, did they, did they use, like for the Brady, for Girls Get Married, the Brady, Brady Brides actually was a three camera sitcom, but right. for, the, for, the, for the TV movie, did they have the original set in storage and that was just the original? Um, no, they, they would always have to rebuild the show. Okay. They would have to rebuild the set. Now there are pieces of the set probably in Toronto because we did something in Toronto and then and here I, I think that the I think that they always destroy the set right before we're going to do it so they get to get paid to rebuild the set that's have you point. Lloyd Lloyd have you seen on YouTube people have fans have like here's an episode of Mannix and here's a, another Paramount yeah. show where it's the Brady house and it's so obviously the Brady house that yeah. I guess they figured, yeah, the audience won't recognize uh, Mike yeah. Connors. Audiences are very started. smart. They recognize all of that. You know, it's funny. We did one of those. We did a show where there was a it was a special about the Brady about the Brady Mania or something, and they got that how the horse. And so I took it home because I said I don't want this to go into any other like what you're talking. I don't want to go into any other Paramount yeah. shows. You'll see this horse. And so I had it in my house, sitting on the wall, you know, on the, on the shelf there. And then uh, I got a call from this. We need that. We got to have that horse back. So I'm not giving it to you back because you're going to put it in some other show. Right. And so I said, okay, well, um, I need you to sign a piece of paper that you can have. It's got to be only for the Brady stuff. Said, okay. So I took it back. And then I read in some book that the horse was like $50,000. I just had it sitting on the shelf. So I didn't oh, know because trivia people, I mean, you know, memorabilia people. <laughs> you still have it? No, I said I had to give it back to him. Oh, 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 okay. I thought, oh, I thought you signed oh. a piece of paper so you could keep it. Okay, guys. No, no, no. Then they took it. <laughs> well, did you save anything, by the way, from, from a, any of the episodes? No. Oh, no. You, because you also thought you might be coming back for another season, too. No. 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 Just we just didn't. Oh. Well, uh, I I mean I recently we we then my parents had a, a storage locker. We just recently emptied. And they gave me a piece of the concrete of the last piece of the, the lagoon. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. That's yeah. I have that piece of slab of concrete. But that's about it. No, All right. we, we were not those people. We just didn't do that. Dad always liked the show to be the thing. And we didn't know in advance. Well, so. but it was also a different time. I mean, today, people, whether it's a TV show or a movie, they're like, hey, can I take the so-and-so? Or can I and put it in their, in their contracts? I get my costumes, things like that. Yeah. I've got a I've got a question. It's a joint Brady Gilligan question. You may not even know the answer, but I I don't you I don't think you and your dad had anything to do with it with the animated series, correct? No, my dad did. Oh, your dad did? Yeah, he had to do all the animated series. Yeah. Okay, so my question is, they changed the theme song for Brady. Was that so they didn't have to pay your dad royalties? Because I don't know. I don't okay. know that. All right. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's my cartoon question of the day. Uh, <laughs> no, it's very sad that I can't. You know, I'm probably the only person who has an answer, and I don't have the answer. So there we go. Well, I did ask. I did ask um, uh, Barry in the in the cartoon, the Brady Kids. Uh, there were many episodes of the last season why he didn't do the voice, and oh. it was a money thing. He yeah. they, they just they it was a favored nations, and they didn't like the money. So I think I think historian Barry, correct me if I'm wrong. I think he tried to hold out and hope that everybody else would do like a friends thing and they didn't. So he was, he was replaced. Yeah. I said, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with the reality, the cartoon shows. No. Um, I got a, I got a closing question here for you is um, just because Bob just brought that up. I am curious what, uh, what happened as, as far as when the show ended, did you know, like, that's it and that's the finale or was it, they came back and said, Hey, the show got canceled. Um, I was at a luncheon and the exec, the uh, vice president of Paramount came up and said, well, we fought the good fight. <laughs> and then I went back to my office and uh, cleaned out the desk and left. So, so no one knew, huh? The kids, nobody knew that that was the final. We, we were no. done. No, no. Wow. Okay. That's pretty the cool. Business does not have a huge amount of heart sometimes. Right. 
Yeah, I remember I, was, I started to leave some of my stuff with my secretary and I started to leave, to leave the, the pencil sharpener and some of the other stuff. And I said, for because they can go back to Paramount. She says, no, take it with you. Nobody coming in wants your old used bin. So I ended up, if you're memorabilia, I have a pencil sharpener from the office. <laughs> <laughs> 50,000. No. Um, well, hey, Lloyd, um, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate uh, having you on. And I sincerely hope Love and Taxes is uh, yeah. good for you. And uh, just thanks for your, you know, just your honesty and stuff. Uh, Bob has spoken about you many times and what a great guy you are. And I will Appreciate say that. I vouch for that right now. Well, I will, I will, I will yeah. quickly say how I met Lloyd. It sure. Was, Lloyd, I don't even know if they do this anymore, but it was sort of like a, an award show for local LA theater. And I was presenting and you and Elliot and Elliot was little came out to me and said, we love Jeff. We love your game show. Yeah. And I'm like, I didn't have Game Show Network. I'd never seen it. Didn't it didn't come on my cable? I'm like, how do you even know about this show? And he, he was oh, a big yeah. fan. He was a big and, fan and, and of Jeff. I was so I was so delighted. In that. <laughs> by the way, that's probably the one and only time people came up to me <laughs> live with that show and said, "We love your we love your your kids Jeopardy show." <laughs> yeah. Well, this was great fun, guys. And yeah, uh, again, to your to your audience, if you go see Love and Taxes. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It's fun. It's romantic. It's sexy. It's all that. Between between Cato and I, we will be cross promoting love and taxes all over the place. Without Perfect. a doubt. Without Perfect. a doubt. Okay. Lloyd, thank you so much. Bob, obviously, I love seeing you as well. Back okay. at you, buddy. Just a thanks, pleasure. Buddy. Hope to see Bye, you guys. sometime, Lloyd. Take care. Bye bye. As always, thanks for listening, and please hit the subscription button and the notification bell so that you can be notified when I have a new episode. And also, go check out uh, some of my other episodes, like Jerry Mathers, Henry Winkler, Judy Norton, so many. Enjoy.